and welcome to this training course on Git. My name is Matt Greencroft and I'm a Java developer and a trainer with Virtual Pair Programmers. This course has been written specifically for Virtual Pair Programmers by Matt Strawbridge. Matt is a professional developer and author, working mainly with c -sharp, JavaScript and Oracle PL stroke SQL. Matt has a vast experience of using Git and other similar tools, and this is the first course that he's written for Virtual Pair Programmers, and we're delighted to have him as part of our team. In this first chapter, we're going to talk about what Git is, and I'll explain the structure of the course. The course is designed to be suitable for anyone wanting to get started with Git and change management, as well as those with some Git knowledge who want to understand these sometimes less familiar aspects of the tool. Although Git is often used by programmers for managing software source code, it is equally adept at managing changes to any types of file. You don't need to be a programmer to follow this course. Now, we will be doing some very basic Java programming in this course, but you actually don't need any Java knowledge to follow along. The code we'll be writing is simply for demonstration purposes, and all the code you need can also be found in the starting workspaces for the course. So let's start then by understanding what Git is. Git is a tool for managing versions of files in a file system, enabling you to track changes and to restore old versions of files. It's worth spending a moment to roll back a few years to the inception of the Git project. Back in 2005, the Linux kernel project was looking to move away from the commercial BitKeeper change management tool that they had been using until then. This tool had served them well, but there were some concerns about using a commercial tool for developing open source software. Now, Git itself is open source, but you are free to use it to help you develop commercial software. Linus Torvalds, who is often described as the benevolent dictator behind the Linux kernel, surveyed the open source alternatives to BitKeeper that were available at the time and decided that none of them was suitable for his needs. So instead, he decided to build his own system. In what has passed into programming folklore, Linus shelved Linux development and spent two solid weeks writing the core of the Git change management system. There's an interesting video of Linus talking about why he created Git, and the URL for this is on screen now in case you're interested. You might like to watch this to get a flavour of the man himself. He certainly doesn't hold back when it comes to criticising Subversion and other change management tools. So it's worth remembering as we work through this course that Git was created by and for the Linux kernel team, and it's designed to solve the problems they had managing lots of commits from developers around the world. And this is a theme we're going to come back to in later chapters. There are, of course, lots of other tools that do this kind of version management or change management. Popular ones include CVS, RCS, Subversion, Mercurial, and Microsoft Team Foundation Server. As we go through the course, we're going to highlight ways in which Git differs from these other systems. But for now, a few things that might distinguish Git from the change management tools you might have used in the past are that it is distributed. In other words, it supports a peer-to-peer -peer collaboration method with no centralized repository. It has exceptionally fast performance for common task, and it handles branching and merging with a minimum of fuss. All three of these things we'll be covering in more detail as we go along. I suppose at this point I should explain why Git has the name that it does. The word Git is a British slang term for someone who thinks they are always correct and tends to be rather annoying. You can find out more about how Git got its name at the URL that I've got on screen right now, but I'll warn you that this page contains some rather fruity language and is not safe for work. I'd like to talk now about the philosophy of Git. To start, Git likes to keep the data model very simple, for example by storing complete files instead of just the differences or deltas between two versions of the file. But then it does clever things with this simple model. In fact, you can think of Git more like an object database, and Git commands are often like querying that database. 
In the next chapter, we're going to explore this data model to understand what it is actually doing behind the scenes as we interact with it. Underpinning how it works and important to the Git philosophy is the use of GUIDs. You might have seen GUIDs or GUIDs, which stands for Globally Unique Identifiers before. They are often used in programming when you need to generate a key that is a short string that is guaranteed not to clash with other keys that have already been generated. Git makes extensive use of SHA-1 hashes for naming its objects. SHA-1 is a cryptographic algorithm and an SHA-1 hash is a fixed length string generated as a one-way hash from some other content. Now, don't worry if all of that doesn't make any sense to you at all. It will soon become clear when we look at some concrete examples later on. For now, though, here's an example of what a full hash looks like. In practice, these are often abbreviated to show just the first seven characters. The basic thing to understand is that file versions get given these hash names inside Git so that they don't clash with each other and can be found very quickly. We'll be seeing lots of hashes in this course and using them will quickly become second nature. If you add a file to Git, its SHA1 hash is generated and that is used internally for referencing that file. This has some useful benefits. If two files have the same hash, then they must be the same files, so Git only has to store them once. Now, in theory, they could be different, but the number of bits in a hash makes the chances of a collision vanishingly small. It really won't happen in practice. The other benefit is that because the name of an object depends on the content of the object, you can easily check that the object in the repository really is the one that was checked in. You can't maliciously change the history of an object and any corruption is easily detected. So just to repeat, because it's quite an important point, when you check a file into version control in Git, Git hashes the content of the file into a short string and uses that string as the name of the object. Git is a distributed change management system. What this means is that developers are free to write code and to check it into Git without the need for some centralized repository. If you use subversion, for example, then most actions such as looking at a log of what's changed or adding a new file need your computer to talk to a server. With Git, it's different. Every developer has a complete clone of the full repository that they can work with. You can take your laptop on a plane with no network connectivity and carry on making changes and checking in code. It's only when you want to synchronize your changes with some other repository that data needs to flow over the network. And Git does that in a very performant way. One thing that can confuse users coming from another change management tool to Git is the index or staging area. This is basically an extra layer sitting between your files on disk and the repository itself. This can seem like an unnecessary step at first, but in later chapters we'll see how having this staging area available makes it possible to keep a clean check-in history even when you find yourself trying to manage multiple changes at once, which can often happen in real-world programming. You can think of Git as an API for enabling a versioning workflow. It doesn't have strong opinions about what file structure you use or what the lifetime of a branch should be. You can use Git however it suits you best. One of the aims of this course is to help you become familiar enough with Git that you can tailor its use to fit in perfectly with your code structure and the processes that you already have in place. I'd like to talk now about how this course is structured. Really, the entire course is one big practical session. Almost from the start, well, at least from the next chapter anyway, we're going to be installing Git and then working in its command line tools together. We have no files to start with and we're going to build up a repository together. 
Now, of course, it's entirely up to you how you do this course, but my intention is that while you're watching the videos, you have your own command line open in another window, if you can, maybe another monitor. And so you're working in your environment alongside mine. In fact, that's why we call our company Virtual Pair Programmers. So you're not going to be just sat listening to me talking endlessly about Git. You're actually going to be doing Git yourself along with me from the start. In the next chapter, in chapter two then, we'll install Git and have a bit more of a basic introduction. And then in chapter three, we'll start learning how to commit and make reviews of the code that we commit into the Git repositories. In chapter four, we're going to learn how to undo commits and use something called the stash, a temporary place for storing changes that we're not yet ready to commit. Chapter five, we'll look at branches and merging. And in chapter six, we're going to be dealing with merge conflicts and something called rebasing. In chapter seven, we'll learn how to navigate the repository. And in chapter eight, we'll look at how to auto commits and change things that have happened in the past. And then in chapter nine, we'll be working with a remote repository and we'll mention GitHub in this chapter also. Chapter 10 is the final chapter where we summarize and give some suggestions as to where you can go next. So I think that's it for this basic introduction. We're ready to go and install Git now, and we'll do that in chapter two. I'll see you there.